is Sushil Shawan. I hope, uh, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. So Sushil, you're gonna have 25 minutes total, including questions. I'm gonna give you a warning uh, after 15 minutes, okay? Okay, let me share the screen again. Yes, please. So is it visible? Yes, great. You can-, okay, you can so Okay, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to, to present the uh, uh, dark matter uh, results uh, from CMS on, on this workshop. So I will be presenting this talk on behalf of CMS collaboration. So, oh, somehow I cannot change. Uh, ah, okay, yeah, it's working, it's working. Okay, I'm on slide two. So let me start from this very nice picture, uh, which kind of uh, give you the landscape of the stark matter searches, ranging from very low masses to very high masses, uh, multi TV and beyond. And we have a different uh, dark matter candidates, QCD, axions, WIMPs, and ultralight dark matter, hidden sector dark matter, and many more uh, such models and theories, which cover this whole mass range. Uh, if you see this hidden dark sector, hidden sector dark matter and ultralight dark matter, they cover a very large mass range. While QCD axions, uh, they cover a much uh, narrow range, for example, the WIMPs also. So in this talk, uh, basically I will be talking about uh, from GEV to TV uh, search region, uh, which, is the, uh, which is the focus of the LSC searches. I'm on slide four. So, we know that we have very strong uh, astrophysical evidence for dark matter. For example, the rotation, rotation curve, the CNBR, the CNBR spectrum, gravitational lensing, and uh, the result from Planck and uh, uh, other experiments. But we still don't know the nature of uh, dark matter candidate. And we unfortunately not have any dark observation, uh, direct observation yet. So LSC is a, is a, is a uh, is a big machine and uh, we know that it can be a, a prime lab for production of dark matter in PP collision. Of course, assuming a dark, uh, dark matter particle have uh, particle origin. So uh, basically the diagram here shown can be looked in three different ways as you know. This is the indirect direction if you look in this way and if you look at the scattering of the, the DM with standard model particle then this is a direct direction. And for collider, we are producing this uh, dark matter in the final states. And at LSE, we can probe a variety of uh, dark matter and standard model interactions. So this will be the focus of this talk. So uh, in the early searches of LSE, we started with the, with the uh, uh, EFT, effective field theories, where we, we assume the mediator are very, very high masses, uh, but it has its own uh, limitations. And now we are uh, working in the region, which we call the simplified models to interpret the dark matter searches uh, at LSC. So the dark matter particle is, a, is, is considered to be direct fermion and it is pair produced by a massive mediator. It could be a vector, excel vector, scalar or pseudo scalar type. And we have the minimal set of parameter in these simplified models uh, where we have this mass of the mediator, mass of the dark matter, the coupling, uh, to, to standard model and coupling to dark matter. And this mediator has minimum decay fit, which is considered to be roughly less than 10%. And we have this uh, complementarity of the direct detection result with the collider searches uh, from the result of these simplified models interpretation at LSE. So there is a dark, uh, dark matter forum, uh, uh, which is a combined forum of ATLAS and CMS, which provide uh, these recommendations for, for what kind of parameter and how should we compare these uh, results with the other experiment. And it has been documented very nicely in this archive paper, which I mentioned here. So uh, in this talk, uh, I will be focusing mo mostly uh, some of the selected results, uh, which, uh, uh, which are from monojet searches, which is one of the benchmark search and very sensitive. Then uh, on the Higgs side, we have the Higgs portal for DM and some latest result on dark photon. And then we have some indirect uh, uh, constraint coming on dark matter parameters from mediator searches, which is mostly DIGET and DIGET plus ISR searches, 
with photon in jet or in boosted region. Uh, one can find complete list at, at this wiki which I have provided here. And uh, basically most of these searches have uh, a high met tail as a, as a signal, except in the digest cases where we are looking for the resonance signal. So if you go on slide seven, so these are the various Winman diagram. And we know the typical signature is large missing transfer momentum plus something. And this something could be a photon, could be a jet, and could be W or Z. We call them the mono X signatures. And then we have uh, other signatures where we have a, a virtual T channel and virtual S channel. Uh, where uh, the scalars or pseudo scalars could decay to uh, dark matter particle uh, along with production of top or top pairs. And then we have other channels where Higgs can uh, decay invisibly uh, either directly to, to the dark matter particle or in association. Then we have certain other uh, two Higgs doublet model plus a pseudo scalar model and Z dynamic production. So these are uh, analysis which I will be covering here today in this talk. So uh, dark matter searches in a nutshell and what, what exactly we do. So basically we, the tr we trigger on the event. We know that these uh, DM don't interact in the, in the detector. So our best bet is on this ISR, gamma jet or H or W or Z. We can easily uh, trigger on them and can select these events. So background, it could be specific to the channel. For example, for mono jet, we have this Z mu plus jet, W L mu plus jet. Uh, with lost lepton and many more, just an example here, then they could be in instrumental backgrounds like faulty detector sector, which are not working at the time of taking the data or the experimental environment, how the pileup goes from one run to another run, uh, depend on, on the, uh, the configuration of the machine. And the standard model background with mismeasured missing transfer energy, for example, QCD multi-jet even and QC gamma. These are some of the common backgrounds, but uh, I listed them in, in terms of the monophoton uh, channel. And then uh, how we uh, do the analysis. So for doing the analysis to measure the background in the signal region, we define certain control region, uh, which have a very similar behavior, uh, but, the, but the, uh, the signal is very negligible in this control region. Analysis can have multiple control region depending on the, the, the background we are targeting. And then we define a transfer factor, which takes this estimation from control region to the signal regions. And uh, in the mono, mono jet and such as a certain analysis, uh, uh, this uh, signal region and control region are simultaneously been like with fit, uh, which, which kind of constrain uncertainty as well as uh, provide robust uh, limit and results. So these are just the analysis step in a, in a very broad sense to give an idea what we do. So let me start with this mono jet mono V uh, analysis, which is also considered one of the benchmark analysis LSE. So result, I'm showing here is from 2016 only as the uh, new results are going to be updated soon. So the backgrounds are here, uh, Z plus Z to new, new instrumental reducible background, for example, W plus Z. And then we trigger, trigger on this initial state radiation. Uh, uh, this analysis is a state of the art theoretical work, for example, uh, next to leading or electrovics and QCD corrections uh, to, to V plus Z uh, uh, are, are applied. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, advancement has been done in this in this area, uh, both theoretically and ex experimentally. And uh, uh, we use this uh, advanced analysis technique using this uh, signal region and control region simultaneous fit to, to really reduce the uncertainty. Uh, for example, here I've shown one of the one of the plot uh, for a W uh, plus Z control region in electronic uh, decay of the W, uh, and you can see the data over Monte Carlo match. And it is uh, on the right hand side is one of the signal region uh, for, the, for the missing energy. And then we can interpret these results in terms of uh, mediator mass versus uh, dark matter plane for, for vector, uh, XL vector, scalar, and pseudo scalar. So for scalar, I've shown here a sigma versus sigma theory rather than the two plane. And one can see this, these, these are the extrusion contours. Uh, plotted for different kind of mediators. And you can easily see that uh, the limits uh, from this monojet channel uh, using just 2016 uh, data is about uh, uh, somewhere between uh, 1.8 to 2 TV for both Excel and uh, Excel mediator. Uh, and 
And then we have this uh, relic density also plotted on this plot in the blue shaded regions. Uh, one thing to remember that uh, these recommendation for the coupling of GQ and GDEM, one comes from, uh, from the uh, recommendation of the Atlas CNS firm. And uh, we, we are using these couplings for, for Excel and vector and Excel vector while for scalar and pseudo scalar, we use uh, GDM and GQ equal to one as per the recommendation. Now these results uh, can be put together with the direct detection and indirect detection. And uh, this is, these are the two plots. Uh, for example, here it is the spin independent. Uh, and we can see that the limit from, from the CMS are competitive in the low DMS region uh, below 5 GB. And similarly for spin dependent, which is the Excel vector mediated is, is around uh, 500 uh, GB of dark matter mass. Similarly, we can also compare uh, these uh, results with the indirect detection, but one has to be careful while providing this result, the coupling and uh, other parameters should be mentioned very clearly uh, because they might be in different phase space. So it is, uh, it should be mentioned here. And uh, here are the monojet limits for, for indirect detection for the annihilation uh, cross-section uh, average over the velocity, pretty velocity. And uh, CMS limits are uh, competitive around 150 GV on the dark matter masses here, which is somewhere here. So the other channel is a uh, single T or TT bar plus MET uh, uh, channel. Sim we have simplified the high flavor plus DM model is used. Basically we look this analysis uh, uh, in TT bar production or single T production in association with, with W and uh, we look all hedonic and single lepton channel. And here uh, we define a MET of 250 jet and 160 jet. Number of jets are also defined depending on which uh, final state we are looking. Again, here also we have uh, six uh, signal regions, uh, uh, regions and we simultaneously optimize various variable in this region to, to do the fit. And these are the results uh, for scalar and pseudo scalar cases. And you can see about, yeah, about 300, uh, nearly 300 jab has been excluded for this scalar and super scalar. Then we have the DM searches in Higgs extended sector and uh, invisible decay. So Higgs can decay directly to DM particles or in association of, uh, in association of W and Z or VVF channel, for example, the diagram here is for VVF channel or in the mono Higgs surface, where we have different channels uh, where Higgs goes to VV, gamma, gamma, tau, tau, uh, plus mat. So we have the combination of these channels also and uh, individual uh, channel also studied. Uh, basically the focus was on three different models, the two Higgs doublet models, uh, the extension of it, two Higgs doublets plus a pseudo scalar model and a baryonic Z model, which I've mentioned here. So if you go slide 14, so these are some of the results from, from the uh, uh, two Higgs doublet model plus a pseudo scalar, where analysis is based on only Higgs to BB, BB bar decay plus MET final state. Uh, the main background are associated production and Z to new new W plus Z, while TT bar single top uh, gives uh, the smaller uh, uh, basically contribute a small portion of the background. And here we have queried the mass of this pseudo scalar, uh, which I'll mention here. And these are the different limits for that. And uh, similarly, uh, the, the exclusion from, from this comes on the MZ prime is uh, somewhere between half TV to, to nearly one TV for a given mass of uh, pseudo scalar 150 J. So this is only for the X2 BB decay. Uh, then this is the Z prime uh, uh, to X tablet model. Uh, here we have used the combination of uh, HDK channel into BB, gamma, gamma, tau, tau, and uh, uh, vector bosons. Uh, and basically, uh, although we have combined, but uh, Higgs to BB plus net dominate above 800 GB, uh, as you can see in this plot on the limit plot, while uh, below 800 GB, it is the Higgs to gamma, gamma plus mod, uh, met, which, uh, uh, which dominates. And here is the uh, plot between MZ prime and uh, MA mass plane, the contour of the limit. Uh, these are the couplings considered for, for, these, uh, for this analysis. 
Excuse me, Sushil, just to let you know that you're 10 minutes away from the end of your time. Yeah. And these are the Z baryonic uh, uh, channel. Uh, here we have a limit uh, from uh, 0.1 to 1.6 TV for a given n prime mass of 300 GV. And these are the 2 DA limits. We also put the uh, MD plane versus uh, sigma spin independent cross section. This black line represent this. Uh, uh, this results and it is uh, again the Higgs to BB bar is the dominant result here. So in the Higgs invisible decay, we, uh, the H goes directly to the this DM particle and this search exploit basically the M J of this uh, VBF uh, jets here and we apply a delta F beta separation between them. Uh, and we fit this MJJ distribution, uh, including the signal regions. For example, here, one of the MJJ distribution is shown from, from, the, from this analysis. Uh, so these are the results. Uh, so uh, the upper limit uh, is calculated on the branching ratio of Higgs to invisible, uh, and it is found to be 0.19 uh, from the combination of all these three years data. This is seven plus eight and 13. And this is the uh, grand combination. While uh, we also plotted in terms of uh, the nucleon cross section, uh, the uh, dark matter nucleon cross section versus the chi result, which are these two lines for two different models. And <clears throat> basically, uh, we have still like 19% uh, limit on, on this Higgs to invisible branching ratios from this. Then we have this latest result uh, of dark photon, which is. Uh, from which is uh, interacting with the Higgs photon model to a dark charged dark sector, where we have Higgs to gamma gamma, where one of the gamma is the massless dark photon. And we look for this empty of the photon plus met as one of the key variable uh, for this signature. And these are some of the distribution from empty distribution of this analysis. And uh, these are the limits, basically a limit on the branching ratio up to 4.6% or nearly 5% is put on the standard model Higgs to gamma plus individual channel here. And this included the full uh, run to data, 137 uh, inverse into bond. Then we have the dark photon search also in another channel. This is the VBF channel, very similar search. We have the uh, VBF like jets here. Uh, we look very high uh, MJJ mass here and large mat. And the limits come from this channel is about uh, if you combine it with the VBF plus uh, ZH together, we get 2.9%. Uh, otherwise we will get uh, just from the VBF uh, around 3.4% limit. Then uh, as we know that mediator can be looked without DM production. So uh, because mediator coupled to initial state and in the offshell region, uh, they can decay to uh, standard model particles. So we can constrain on this coupling GQ for a given DM mass. Uh, so these are basically kind of reinterpretation of digit mass searches for, for new physics as I shown here. And uh, we have uh, in recent times also done the scouting analysis which uses the limited information stored at the trigger level, basically utilizing the bandwidth and the disk space. And it allow us to go lower in the uh, mass region. So these are basically from digest searches. And uh, we can also look, uh, we can go further lower by looking ISR, uh, jet or gamma. Uh, by triggering on them, and we can even go lower. Uh, in this region, typically uh, the product is boosted. Uh, uh, These uh, digits are boosted and they are merged. So we have the boosted analysis also. This plot basically gives a summary of that. And as you can see, uh, we can go up to 10 GV from this uh, boosted digit plus uh, this ISR search of photon, while we have this uh, another search of, from digit where the boost is coming from the recoiling against the initial state uh, gamma inject, uh, gluon inject. So we can go up to 10 GV to few TV. So let me come to the summary of uh, the searches. Basically spin zero, we have this mediator mass versus dark matter mass plane where various results have been assigned. And we have, we have not considered the coupling for lepton because the, those constraints will be very very uh, dominating here, but in the summary uh, plot, uh, you can find it here, you can have those plot too, where non-zero GL uh, coupling is there. This is for the spin zero mediator, and this is for spin one mediator search summary. 
uh, as you can see, these are the basically low, low mass searches, which I was mentioning in the last two slides. And uh, yeah, this uh, brings to the summary of this. So uh, CMS has a very broad and extensive search program. Uh, apart from uh, conventional searches, we have looks so new interpretation, new combination, for example, dark photon and uh, uh, T-channel searches are taking shape, uh, uh, new DM searches channels such as uh, in association with leptoquark production, which I'm not covered here, are also being analyzed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have not found any smoking gun for DM at LSC yet, but uh, we should stay tuned for more new results from CMS with full run to data, as I've mostly shown here 2016. And uh, of course, in near future from run three. So I guess that's it from my side. Thank you very much, Sushil, for the very nice talk. So I received a, a question from Marcio. I'm going to pass it to you since we have uh, a few minutes. So uh, Marcio is asking, are there any implications for collider searches from the fact that the model can be more or less complete? Oh, sorry, I missed the last part of the question. The... Uh, so are there any implications for collider searches from the fact that the model can be more or less complete? Um, I guess it means models... uh, if, uh, if you can search for other ingredients uh, which are typical of the model. Well, well one, one aspect is definitely, as I mentioned in my slide also, we are trying to, uh, trying to explore new avenues like, uh, like the dark photon searches are coming up. <laughs> Have only the S channel searches, we have not looked the T channel searches yet as much as uh, we could have done. So this Atlas CMS dark photon is also giving the recommendation on the T channel searches and we are you know, taking on that. Beside that's uh, going lower and lower masses also one, one thing. Uh, so we are also kind of spending. But uh, apart from that, uh, I don't know, I mean, it's kind of evolving, uh, you know, it's an evolving discussion. So. So maybe Marcio, if you uh, if you want to add something, you can write. I hope I, I, yeah, I hope I understand this question correctly. So I see that there is uh, a raised hand from Nepomuceno. We have two minutes. Uh, so if it's a pretty short question, you can go ahead. Oh yeah, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So can you go back to slide 17, please? I think it's there, so yeah. The, uh, sorry, I cannot see the slide number. It, it, it's, uh, the next one. The next one. Next slide. You mean 16? No, next. Oh, you mean the 18? Yeah. Uh, no, sorry. I think it's 19. <laughs> can you can you go to 19? 19? Yeah, that one. So I'm just curious. This uh, when you re reconstruct the the transverse mass in in this context. So do, do, do you take the bilepton system, the moment of bilepton system, is, is that it? The, the dilepton system is? Yeah. I, I didn't hear the, uh, I'm, I'm not. So uh, what's the last I, part of the question? Uh, okay, so when you reconstruct the, the transverse mass, I, I assume that you're taking the, trans, uh, the dilepton system moment, right? Yeah, I, I guess, yes. Okay, so just, just just to be sure. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so, so okay, I stopped sharing now. Thank you. Yeah, I don't see any 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 further questions. So, Sushil, let me thank you again for the very nice talk. Good question. If anybody comes up with any question uh, in the next minutes, uh, please feel free yeah, please. to send them directly to Sushil. So we move on with our next speaker. Our next speaker is going to be Sergio. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I can also see your share screen. Perfect. Okay. So Sergio, you're going to have 20 minutes. I'm going to give you a warning after 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So first of all, thank you to the organizers for allowing me to present today. Um, so as you can see, I'm going to talk about uh, to some of the analysis that we are doing in Atlas for searching that matter. I will cover a few of them, uh, mostly based on how recent the results have been published. And I will go as far in detail as I can the time that I have. 
So first, I have uh, my typical slide for Darnata introduction. So as we all know, there are these cosmological observations that point to the existence of some sort of exotic matter that is not accounted by ordinary matter, like the flat rotation cores or gravitational lensing, and also the presence of large structures in the universe. And even though we have this much evidence, we still are a bit unsure on the nature of dark matter. And there are many experiments in the world trying to detect it. And, and these experiments typically fall into three categories. You have um, indirect detection experiments where you try to look for the annihilation of dark matter in telescopes such as Fermilat or MAGIC. Then you also have direct detection where you try to detect the scattering of uh, dark matter particles with some standard model particle that you have in a container. And this is the case for Xenon Quanton or Lux or Dama Libra. And then another approach is to go through the collider production where you try to produce dark matter via the collision of particles. And this is something that can be probed with the LHC and has already been studied previously with Tevatron, for example. So then I have here one slide about uh, some possible candidates for dark matter. So the first thing we will do is to look the standard model. Uh, there, the only one that kind of could be dark matter is the neutrino in the sense that it's uh, massive and neutral. However, it's too light and it's not cold and this precludes it to behave similarly as what, how, dark, how dark matter does. And so it's clear that we have to go beyond the standard model in order to describe dark matter in, in particle physics. Uh, a very canonical candidate has been the WIMP or weakly interacting massive particles. But then we also have other models such as SUSI or action-like particles, which also put forward a dark matter candidate. So then um, how do we go about detecting dark matter in uh, colliders? So uh, here I have a diagram that kind of serves for illustrating this. So the idea is that we collide uh, to a standard model particles. Uh, maybe we get a mediator to the dark sector and then maybe get a per-production, for example, of dark matter. Uh, this dark matter would escape the detector, but then you can detect it indirectly via some sort of initial state radiation here, kind of illustrated with an X, where the X can be a photon, a jet, a vector boson. Uh, this type of signatures are referred to as mono X signatures, and then you can have as many analyses as imagination you have for X. And here I'm, today in this slide, I'm going to uh, describe a few of them. And then another approach you can do is to try to search for the mediator via a resonance search, which is the approach that is followed in some of these analyses. So then a few words on ATLAS. Uh, ATLAS is a very nice detector in the LHC. It's comprised of a variety of subdetectors. You have uh, the tracker system where you can get the tracks for charged particles. You can also get information on energy depositions for uh, in the electromagnetic or the hadronic calorimeter. And then you also have the muon chambers to detect the muon that go through the full detector. And then by combining all of this information, in principle, you can reconstruct the particles that uh, were involved in a given event. The picture then is a bit not so nice because you also have second collisions and pile up, uh, which then makes another point of that you have to trigger on events that are interesting. Atlas has a two-level trigger, one based on hardware and one based on software which is the, what ultimately decides on which events are permanently stored, which is actually a very small fraction compared to what all the collisions that are made. And then a given analysis will go and select the trigger that is more interesting for their studies. So I'm going to start now with uh, one of these analyses. One, I'm going to start with monophoton. It's uh, been recently published on an archive. The idea is to look for dark matter in events with an energetic photon. So you cut hard on the photon PT and on the missing transverse energy. Then you can also apply some cuts like lepton beta or cuts on the met significance or in the delta phi between the met and the photon in order to reduce backgrounds, which are mainly coming from uh, the two neutrinos plus a photon, which is completely indistinguishable from a monophoton signature. Then you can also have contributions from fake events or in the sense that uh, an electron or a jet is misidentified as a photon. And then you also have uh, contributions from the leptonic decay of the W where the charged lepton is misidentified or something. And then you also get a background for this channel. And then you try to constrain these backgrounds using control regions, which then allow you to get a prediction of in the signal region in order to see if you have made a discovery or not. Uh, in this slide, 
uh, shows the Data Monte Carlo agreement in the different control regions first, and then in the last four bins in the single region. We can see that there is a very nice agreement, which means then that the resource, what we do is to translate them in uh, uh, limits into a variety of models. What I have in this slide is a comparison with direct detection experiments. In this case, it's the spin-dependent case for the dark matter nuclear interaction. Uh, in order to showcase the power of the atlas in searches for, uh, for masses below 500 GeV. Uh, this analysis also made uh, limits in WIM searches, which I'm going to show a bit later. First, I'm going to move to MonoJet, very benchmark analysis in dark matter uh, searches. Uh, basically, the idea is to have a jet uh, missing ET, and this event display shows a very spectacular event with a very energetic jet basically in recoiling against nothing. Uh, so you cut hard on the JPT and on the missing ET, and then you also beat leptons and photons to reduce backgrounds. Then you also can apply some topological cuts uh, in the sense of uh, asking the jets and the missing ET to be back to back. Uh, all of this in order to reduce the backgrounds, which are similar to monophoton. Uh, basically, we have the two neutrinos plus jets. Then also a similar case for the leptonic case of the W. And what they do here is that they do a simultaneous bin like to fit on the PT recoil in five different control regions in order to extract a normalization factor for the deplaged processes and two normalization factors for TT bar and singleton. And as, as it was also introduced in the previous talk, this analysis has reached a very high level of precision that requires um, state of the art corrections for the deplaged processes which is provided by theories and yield a level of precision of next to next to leading order in QCD and next to leading order plus the of rocks in electroweak. And this level of precision that allows us to correlate the B plus its processes and get uh, the background prediction in such high level of precision. We can see here some, uh, some examples of the Data Monte Carlo agreement in two of the control regions and also here on the single region. Uh, where the total background uncertainties go from 1.5% at the beginning of the PT recoil distribution and up to 4.1% at the tail. Since, since no significant excess has been detected, then the results are translated into a variety of models. Here I'm just showing a few. For example, if there is the, a limit in the SUSI compressed scenario where you have the neutralino and they stop almost degenerating mass and here MonoJet excludes up to 550 GeV. Another model considered is an extra, extra dimensions model, the ADD, which comes from an effective field theory which has a scale of this MD parameter, uh, which is uh, excluded for below 11.3 TeV at two extra dimensions and 5.9 TeV at six extra dimensions. These two plots show here a blue line, which shows the result from the previous iteration of the paper in order to see the improvement here. And then there was a new model considering this iteration, which comes from action-like particles, via an effective field theory that introduces an ALP that can couple two gluons. And then you can probe this coupling and set limits on the plane bit of the coupling with effective mass of the theory. Uh, this analysis also set limits in other models, but I don't have time to show them here. Although I do show here a combination on the WIMP simplified model. So basically it's the phase space of the mass of the dark matter and the mediator. Here we have these shapes that correspond to a various mono X analysis and two of them I showcased in this presentation. We can see MonoJet being more powerful than MonoPhoton. Uh, then there is also results from resonance searches, which uh, have different assumptions. And in this case, I'm showing the leptophobic channel with the coupling of two leptons to zero. And then we can also do this comparison in direct detection, which is also shown here. And the selection of couplings comes from this uh, common benchmark. Um, and more information can be found in the notes. Okay, so now moving to another analysis, uh, very interesting analysis, where we have dark matter uh, produced in association with a Higgs boson that decays into a pair of photons. This then allows you to trigger using two photons, which then gives you a very clear uh, signature. And there are three theoretical models use a signal for this analysis, the, the Z prime model, the Higgs doublet model, and the Higgs doublet model plus subscalar. Backgrounds for this analysis come from diphotons that are resonant from standard model Higgs, and also 
from uh, type photon events that are non resonant from QCD in, in your events, and then fake mm -hmm. contributions, and then some. You're, you're 10 minutes away from the end of your time. Okay, thank you. And then some contributions from resolution uh, related uh, issues with the detector. Okay, so here I try to summarize the selection. So the, the use a primary vertex obtained via a neural network. Then they, as I said, they trigger on two photons and they also have some cuts on the leading and subleading PTs of the photons and also on the ratio of the energy with the dye photon mass. They apply a lepton veto and then they look for the resonance of the Higgs in the dye photon mass. And then they have some missing requirements cutting at 90 GB and the missing ET. And then in this interesting variable of delta ET miss, which is defined as the difference between the ET miss calculated with this primary vertex from the neural net and the missing ET calculated from the hardest vertex. And this is useful because low values of this variable are related to genuinely invisible particles. Then after applying this selection, uh, a VDT is used, which uses as variables the PT of the Typhoton system and the missing ET significance. Here we can see the nice agreement between that and Monte Carlo for these variables. And then here we can see the VDT score, which shows the discrimination power that is obtained through this VDT. Then the analysis categorizes the events in four categories based on low or high missing ET and tight or loose BDT cut. Uh, this is done in order to improve sensitivity and also to complement uh, analysis in the low ETMIS research, the mono HPV, which is also something that we have seen in the previous talk. Similar. And then they set results on the models that they consider. Here I show, for example, the set baryonic prime model, where the limit has improved up to one. Uh, 1,150 GB from being under 1 TeV uh, in the Z prime beam mass. And then in the dark matter mass has increased to 280 GB extended by more than 100 GB. And this improvement may mainly comes from the increase in data and also from this use of multivariate analysis techniques. Then from one of the other models, the Higgs doublet, they also see improvement in the mass of the Cebus scale. Uh, that goes up to 420 GB for a mass of the mediator of 18, 825 GB. Okay, then another very interesting analysis is the dark Higgs decay to hadronic BB. So the dark Higgs model is basically motivated by the need of giving mass to the dark sector. And then if you want to do something similar as we do in the standard model, then you produce a dark Higgs. And then the mixing between the standard model Higgs and the dark Higgs give you similar decays for this new scalar. And so then what this analysis does is focus on large missing ET from the dark matter and then on the fully hadronical BB decay of the dark Higgs, which gives the large branching ratio. However, this then gives you a very challenging reconstruction of the multi-prong hadronic system here, which then motivates the use of new uh, techniques for uh, reconstructing jets, jets, which is this track-assisted entry clustering algorithm. Then there are various regions. You will beat on leptons to get your signal region, and then you also have control regions with a different amount of leptons. But then you can also have two topologies, depending on how boosted the system is. If your dark Higgs is boosted enough that the results from the hadronic decay can be reconstructed in one target, then you are in the merged topology, where they apply some cuts on the PT of the large jet and in the mass, and also in the substructure variables. But then you can also have cases such as in the intermediate topology, where some of the prongs is not fully inside the larger jet, in which case you apply some cuts on the mass of the target. You also ask for a delta R of having another jet close to this target. And then you supplement the mass of the system with combinatorics, depending on what is the mass of the target. And then they also have a window cut on the dark heat as much. Dominant background contributions here come from the two neutrino plus jets and leptonic case of the W and is constrained with control regions. Here we can see, again, a nice agreement between Delta and Monte Carlo in the control regions, but also in the signal region, which means that then the results are translated into limits into this phase space of the mass and the, of the dark Higgs and of the Z prime, which is a final state that has been investigated for the first time with this analysis. So then I also wanted to show at least one uh, resonance search. This case is one where they look for a, res a mediator that decays into a Z boson and a Higgs that goes into BB bar. And then you have a final state with B jets and a uh, different amount of leptons. Then the signals that they consider is the Higgs tablet model and then heavy vector triplet model. And similarly as in the previous analysis, they have two regimes depending on the boosting of the system. 
in the case where it's not pushed enough and the B jets are reconstructed into separate small jets, this is the, the resolved topology. And then in the case where you can fully reconstruct into one larger jet, it's the merged topology. And then you do a cut based analysis by applying cuts on the jet and the lepton PT and the missing ET to reduce background contributions. And then you have different windows in the mass of the digit system depending on the lepton multiplicity and the topology. Then the backgrounds that are involved here depend on which region you are. For example, in the zero lepton, the dominant backgrounds are from Z plus jets and TT bar events, but also from W plus jet events. And here, a sideband region from the digit mass is used to improve the B plus jet kinematic modeling and also to constrain the TT bar and the B plus jet background. And then in the case of the two lepton region, here the most the main contribution is coming from Z plus jets and then followed by TT bar. And here, the sideband region from the digit mass is used as a validation region for C plus jets kinematics. And then a control region is used to constrain TT bar normalization in the feed. Here we see the results in the signal in one two of the signal regions. Uh, again, we have good agreement between data and Monte Carlo, and the results are then translated into limits. And we can see here that they improve from the previous iteration of this analysis using 3.2 inverse femtobar from about 50% at uh, 300 GB of the Z prime mass and up to 500 G, uh, 500% improvement for a mass of 50. Then uh, I just have a short slide about invisible heat because I, I realized later that now Jack is going to present this in, in much better detail. But basically, this is interesting in order to probe the, the idea of the, having the Higgs as a portal to the dark sector. And to do this by measuring the branching ratio of the Higgs going to invisible, which in the standard model is around 0.1% from the Z to Z decay that then goes fully neutrino. And there was recently a note where it showed the result by combining the BBF plasmet and TT bar H plasmet and run one uh, results. And here this table summarizes. Oh, oh. mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and here this table summarizes the results. And we see for this note uh, actually around 0.11. Okay, and then I'm already concluding. So we still have this very big unknown from dark matter and the LS experiment contributes by searching this in a wide range of channels. I showcased here a few of them, monophoton, and which has this new action like particle interpretation, mono H to gamma gamma, which includes these new techniques, mono jet, which has this very high level of precision, mono SVD hadronic, which uses this very uh, fancy reconstruction techniques for the dark jet algorithm, and then the rich phenomenological studies from resonance searches. Currently, Atlas is in this shutdown for upgrading, and DM searches will continue in run three, taking advantage of these upgrades and also more luminosity. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, Sergio. So we have a question from Valentina Cesare. So let me pass it on to you. So Valentina is asking, which neural network algorithm do you use to select the primary vertex? Well, yeah, so... I cannot really answer that without going to the node because I don't personally participate in this analysis. Uh, maybe I will put on the on the chat the link to the node, and then they can check. Okay. 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 Yes. So so maybe when you can be in contact later on. Okay. Great. So since we are running out of time uh, and. Uh, I don't see any further question. So I would suggest if you have uh, anything else to ask to Sergio, please contact him directly in the chat. So Sergio, thanks a lot uh, again for the very nice talk. Mm -hmm. We move on to next speaker, which uh, is also a member of the Atlas collaboration, mm -hmm. Jack Linden. Jack, are you there? Oh, hello, can you hear me okay? Hi, yes, yes, now we can hear you. Would you share your screen, please? Yeah. Okay. Can you see my? Can you see my slides? Brilliant. Yes. Yes, we can. So, Jack, you're gonna have uh, twenty minutes. Uh, I'm gonna give you a warning after ten. Okay. Sorry. Hi. Right. So, I'll be given an update on uh, current searches for invisible decays of the Higgs boson in the Atlas detector at the LHC and an interpretation of these searches in terms of dark matter models. 
So there's a lot of reasons why Higgs bosons decaying invisibly is an interesting signature to search for. Uh, firstly, a lot of beyond standard model models include interactions between the Higgs and dark matter, both with dark matter directly coupling with the Higgs boson and with dark matter coupling by additional mediators of the Higgs boson. And for example, one way dark matter may gain mass in the same or similar way that standard model particles gain mass through the Higgs mechanism, which obviously opens up direct coupling to massive dark matter. Additionally, the Higgs being the only scalar particle in the standard model also allows interactions in a lot of uh, BSM models that are suppressed or not allowed in, with other non-scalar particles. So through the Higgs portal, we can potentially create dark matter in the Atlas detector. And then with a few exceptions, uh, BSM models usually, or almost always, predict dark matter to have no noticeable interaction with the detector. And so this, these signatures will look like an will look invisible. Unlike some other dark matter searches, Higgs Invisible also has the advantage its prediction in the standard model is very small, uh, a bank fraction around 0.1%, which allows us to distinguish even quite small BSM effects from the standard model. And because of all these reasons, Higgs to invisible is very interesting. So a lot of analyses have tried to search for it. And to set the strongest limits that we can, we need to have a way to combine these analyses. And shown on the right in this slide here are a bunch of analyses that have searched for the signature and the combination paper that I'm going to be discussing here. And so how do we actually detect this if Higgs to invisible, if it's invisible? Well, we need a signature where the Higgs to invisible is created alongside some other particles that we can detect. These particles we can detect will have their kinematics affected by the Higgs to invisible decay. And then from these kinematics, we can then infer uh, the existence of Higgs to invisible. For example, it might leave a missing momentum signature. Shown here are two such signatures which have been searched for in run two, uh, vector boson fusion on the left, where the initial colliding quarks uh, both emit a vector, vector boson, then interact the former Higgs, which decays invisibly. These, these quarks then hadronize and form jets with a large separation in ether and have a large uh, MJJ. And then there's another signature shown just to the right here, where two gluons collide, each forming a pair of top quarks. And then one top quark from each of the pair interacts the former Higgs, which then decays visibly. Uh, you can, of course, replace these top quark with any other quark, and you still have a valid diagram that will contribute. However, the top quark case is particularly useful for two reasons. Uh, one is just that since the top is the most massive quark by quite a large amount, uh, it couples with the Higgs very strongly since the Higgs couples the mass. And also, the top decays are quite clean compared to some other quarks in the, and it tends to be a bit easier to extract information about the initial interaction than it does with other quarks. This then, uh, this interaction then, of course, what we will see depends on how the two top quarks then, the two top quarks then decay. Uh, we consider two different ways, one where both top quarks decay uh, into oppositely charged leptons, and these leptons may be the same flavor or they might not, we consider both cases and also where both top quarks decay orthodontically. There, of course, is also the kind of middle case where one decays orthodontically and one decays lepton, uh, but we don't currently uh, consider this case for the, uh, for, for the Higgs search, but may be included in the future. So shown here are these two TT bar uh, H analyses I just discussed, one which has the orthodontic case uh, at the top, and one which has the oppositely charged lepton case. For the all-hadronic case, we require at least two B tag jets and a high missing momentum to assure an efficient trigger. Our signal variable in this case is the, is the large radius jet mass, which is influenced by the Higgs to invisible decaying. And this is shown on the plot to the right here. You can see the Higgs to invisible, uh, the, the signature that Higgs to invisible will have in this for a branching ratio at just about the limit we can set. And then there's the oppositely charged lepton case uh, shown below, where we require oppositely charged leptons, and also we require at least one B-tag jet. Our signal variable here is a bit different. It's the MLL variable, uh, 
the mass of the two leptons, which we require to be at least 20 GeV higher than the mass of the Z. Otherwise, you get a, revenant, a resonance and you get a very high uh, Z plus jet background. Uh, again, this signal variable is, of course, influenced by the Higgs invisible decay, which is shown overlaid with, again, with a Higgs that has a ranking ratio would be just about detectable uh, here. And for both of these analyses, you can see the measured distribution is quite consistent with the standard model distribution, but there are uh, quite large fluctuations, which is because the statistics here are quite small. But as mentioned earlier, since the standard model prediction of the Higgs invisible branching ratio is very low, even with these low statistics, we can set pretty good uh, limits on it. So then uh, here is the other analysis that was discussed, the Beckler boson fusion analysis. Analysis, and as mentioned, this produces two jets and have a which have a missing momentum from the invisible decay of the Higgs boson. This in, this missing momentum could be quite low, but uh, but we require it to be high, which is to reduce the multi-jet background, which is very large at low missing momentum, and it's also quite hard to model, so it introduces a very large uncertainty. And for a similar reason, we also require a low uh, delta phi JJ. These jets produced typically have a large MDJ and are in opposite longitudinal hemispheres of the detector. And so we require there, we require that, and we also require there to be at least two jets, since the both fusion involved two jets, but we can also allow up to an additional two jets, so four jets in total, uh, as long as the two high momentum jets fulfill all the requirements for the both on fusion mentioned here. Uh, we then bin these in multiple different signal regions. And these are kind of outlined in this plot to the top right. And we bring these in the MJJ and Delta Phi JJ plane. And for the for just the NJ equal two K three, we have a lot of different signal regions. Whereas for the NJ NJet three and four case, we have a single inclusive signal region for all these different for all the NJ equal four, three and four case. The darkness of the color in this plot uh, indicates the the signal to background ratio, so darker as a higher signal to background. And the, per the percentage listed here is the percentage of the signal that is in that bin. So for example, signal region five has a very good signal to the background region, but the signal itself is actually quite low in that bin. So it has a high signal to background ratio because the background is also very low. And, and as mentioned uh, earlier, that we want to combine all these analyses. And a way to make this quite a lot easier is to make sure all these analyses are orthogonal, meaning that there are no events in, in one analysis that is also in another analysis. And so to do this with the vector boson fusion case, we make this orthogonal to TTH by construction by vetoing leptons. So obviously it's got no, uh, no events in common with the case where we require two leptons. And we also require less than two B jets, so it has no events in common with the uh, H where we require more than two V e tank jets. And shown in the bottom right here is an inclusive signal region, which combines all the signal regions together and is plotted over MJJ. And again, I've overlaid a Hig uh, Higgs to invisible uh, signature here, which is just at the limit that we can just about set a limit at. And as you can see, as you can see, compared to the uh, TTH case, there's a lot more events. So we then go to the next slide. Yeah, so then with these analyses that have just been mentioned, uh, we perform multiple combinations. First, we have to combine the two TTH cases and until we have a single result for TTH altogether. And shown in the top right here is a plot of this for the, uh, for the branching ratio of Higgs to invisible. As you can see, the dominant case here is the oppositely charged lepton case. But the correction from the all hadronic case is also a uh, it's, it's it's quite is sizable and and when combined the best fit result of this is very close to zero. And then so now that we've combined these together, we have to combine this with the vector boson fusion case. And in this case, the bet the boson fusion is very dominant, as you can see in the bottom right plot. But again, the TTH case when combined uh, improves the overall result by a by an, a bit. And then after we've combined these two, we then this this was all done at run two uh, in Atlas, which is all square root uh, s equal 13 TV collisions. Um, but there was also a combination done in run one in uh, 
collisions at 7 and 8 TV. And so we then combine these results with this run one combination. And Jokes, this, excuse pardon? me. You're 10 minutes away from the end of your time. Oh, okay. That's okay. So then this run one combination included lots of different analyses. Um, it included one in one in a similar to the run two, which is better build on fusion case. Or it, it doesn't include the TTH case, but it does include some other analyses. Uh, includes ZH to leptons and W or Z plus H to jets. And just like the run two case, the dominant contribution here is that they're both on fusion by quite a significant amount. So shown here are the final results after we do this final combination, combining the run one and run two results. On the left, you can see the run one, run two combinations, of which as you'd expect, the run two is dominant, and then it's corrected a little bit by the uh, one, result, one result, getting a slightly uh, slightly better result. And on the right, you can see each individual analysis, which again, the run to uh, VBF is the uh, vector fields and fusion, is the dominant result. Shown in the table at the bottom uh, are the results for the best fit on the branching fraction and the limits that we can set on this, uh, both observed and expected. You can see they're quite consistent with each other. And for the form combination, we set a best fit value of zero, which is uh, plus or minus 6%, and a limit less than 11%, which again, as mentioned before, uh, the standard model prediction is 0.1%, uh, so that's a system of that. And shown here are the limits from that previous plot, but uh, perhaps an easier way to see, uh, shown as a, as a plot. And as you can see, the limits is dominated by better bills and fusion, as mentioned, which is then improved slightly when we combine with TTH that improved again if we can combine it with run one. And we set, as mentioned, we can set a very strong limit of 11%, which is again consistent with the standard model prediction of 0.1%. But there's still, still a lot, obviously, a long way to go and a lot of improvements to be made, which hopefully in the future we will uh, reach this position. And so, yeah, so then we, so to do this improvement, uh, we need to improve things such as our systematic uncertainties. And so the improvement we need to make is around, to be consistent with the standard model prediction is around 100 times. So there's still a lot of potential for BSM in there. And so currently we are dominated by systematic uncertainties and shown in the table on the right here are the different uncertainties and how much they contribute. And as can be seen, particularly jet reconstruction and lepton reconstruction slash ID are quite significant. And our background modeling and also the size of our Mon Monte Carlo samples have a fairly significant amount of uh, contribution, uh, all roughly to the same amount, those three different things. And so of course, improvement to these in the future will allow us to set a stronger limit. And as well as just improving systematics, is it here? Uh, of course, there's just getting more statistics, which will obviously get in the future. But there's also adding more analyses. So lots of analyses you can contribute to this channel. And so we've already discussed some, but there's more that are currently working towards it. For instance, the Monojet channel has recently set a limit on the Higgs invisible branching fraction. This hasn't yet been included in the combination. So including that will also uh, improve our limits slightly. And it would also be useful to reproduce some of the analyses that went into the wrong com one combination that I mentioned before that haven't been formed in run two yet. And so finally, this branch infraction can be interpreted in terms of a Higgs portal model. And there's a lot of BSM that can be interpreted in terms of, but we have interpreted it in this case in terms of the Higgs portal model, where the Higgs decays into a pair of WIMPs. Uh, two different WIMP models have been considered, uh, Scalar um, Majorana, and as you can see, we can set a fairly we can set a strong limit on a Majorana. And shown here are the limits we set in comparison to direct detection experiments. Uh, as you can see, direct detection experiments set very strong limits on high wimp masses, where we actually we can't set very strong limits. But while they set, while direct detection experiments set very strong limits at high wimp masses, they tend to perform less well at low wimp masses, where which is largely just to kinematics. 
but, uh, but in our case, we can still set limits to quite low wind masses very effectively. So we are very complementarity to direct uh, detection experiments, and combined with them, we can cover a uh, large phase space. So in conclusion, we've combined uh, multiple analyses in both run one and run two of the uh, Atlas, uh, Atlas detector running. And with this, we've set a very strong limit on the Higgs invisible branch infection, which is consistent to the standard model prediction. However, while the limit is very strong, there's still a lot of work to be done until we can uh, bring this limit down to the to be consistent to, to the level of the standard model prediction. And there's plenty of room for BSM to still show up. And then this branch infraction that we've set a limit on has been interpreted in terms of two WIMP models. Which uh, we set, which complementarity to direct detection, we set quite strong limits. And of course, there's a uh, more BSM that we can uh, interpret into in the future. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Jack. So, uh, if anybody has any question, please come forward. Okay. So for the moment, I don't see anything. So maybe I can ask you a very something that I missed. So when you say that uh, you the, you aim to bring down the level of the differentiation of X to invisible to the standard model prediction, you mean uh, you mean when exactly? Oh, uh, th th that wouldn't be for a long time. I'm just, uh, yeah, that's not in the near future. But, but obviously, we will continue to increase uh, gradually. And hopefully, one day, we will reach that. But that's not that particular aim isn't something we're aiming for right now. That's a very large improvement. Yeah, no, I, I guess my question is more, is it, uh, is it possible with uh, in the future with a high luminosity LHC or a high energy LHC, or is it something that uh, we will still have to wait a bit more when a new collider? Uh, I think most likely we'd have to wait for a new collider like the yeah. FCC or such, but, we, sh but we, sh we should, with the HLHC, we will come quite close to it, but I don't think we'd manage to quite reach it. Okay, okay, I see, I see. Okay, thanks. <laughs> no problem. So, okay, so I don't see any question. May, may I ask a very general question to check? Sure, Fabio, yes, please go on. All the speakers, whenever you perform analysis, you've shown all of you that it's very model dependent, right, the way you interpret it. So, uh, the, the question is, is there any degeneracy of the signature that you're observing with anything which is not dark matter? Because as, a, as a someone closer to astrophysics, what we identify as dark matter is something that uh, is cosmological of a, uh, it's stable over cosmological time scales. So I assume that you can interpret whatever you're seeing in a specific model and that thing in that model is perhaps stable, but you, is there any alternative way to interpret whatever that signal is? So take any specific signature that you have. Yeah, so with, the, with this particular case, uh, obviously what we've done at the moment is for the interpretation we put here, we've only interpreted it in terms of dark matter, but there are plenty of other models that could influence it. For instance, you could have some internal loop uh, that the Higgs couples with and that uh, that isn't necessarily dark matter, but then perhaps can interact with dark matter or maybe is completely separate. And this would, Im this would influence the uh, branch infraction. And a lot of beyond standard model models uh, do have this sort of interaction with the Higgs. Uh, the fact that it's scale scalar for, it allows it to interact in some ways with BSM that a lot of other particles can't. So it's quite, I think overall the the branch infraction rate that we can set limits on this branch the branch infraction itself is quite sets good limits on a lot of different BSM uh, or at least it can but at the moment we've only interpreted in terms of the uh, dark matter but we have caught we it can be interpreted in terms of lots of different models lots of things can influence the branch infraction here lots of BSM things yeah but not necessarily stable okay thank you very much Jeff. thank you okay very good so I don't see any further question and also we're basically out of time. So Jack, let me thank you again very much. Thank if you. anybody has further questions for Jack, please send them directly to him via the chat. So we move on to our last talk thank of you. this collider session. Our next speaker is gonna be Martina. Hello. 
Hi. Hi. Would you start sharing your screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. I I, I hear you a bit far away. Do do you can can you manage to 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 move a bit closer to the to the microphone maybe? Maybe. A bit better. better. Okay. Um, so, uh, hello everyone. Um, uh, I'm very happy to to be here and present today. Um, uh, give a presentation about the sector at Bell Two experiment. Uh, I will go through my slide, starting from uh, SuperCAC B and Bell 2 experiment description, focusing on the upgrade from uh, CAC B and Bell. A Bell. Uh, then I uh, will move on a very general introduction about the sector, and then uh, I will focus mostly on uh, the first results about the sector searches at Bell 2 and the ongoing, the main ongoing analysis. So uh, let's start with super B. Super B it's an asymmetric uh, electron positron collider uh, located uh, at Tsukuba in Japan. Uh, it is a second generation B factory, and in fact, it is an upgrade with respect to its pre predecessor KECB, uh, mainly for the luminosity it can reach. Uh, in fact, if you watch the luminosity formula, you can see it depends on some constant factor, like the Lorentz factor, the electric charge, and the electric radius. Uh, it depends on uh, reduction factors, which is uh, mostly, most of the time, it's not far from one. And then the, mm, it depends on, uh, finally, three uh, quantities that we can manage to modify uh, to uh, rise our luminosity. And in fact, uh, um, from uh, CACB to super CACB, um, we managed to uh, gain uh, a factor 30 in total, uh, a 1.5 um, factor from total beam current and a factor 20 from the beta function at DAP, mainly thanks to, to this nano beam scheme uh, technology. Uh, so we have no more head and collision, but we have uh, um, collision with a crossing angle between the two beams uh, um, different from zero. And uh, 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 an overlap, uh, um, small, smaller overlap between the two beams. Uh, so this allows us to have uh, our luminosity target to be uh, 6 times 10 to the 35 centimeters to the minus 2 per second. And we already reached the world distant luminosity record. Uh, so we um, are collecting uh, data uh, since uh, 2018. We started with our pilot run in which we collected uh, 500 inverse peak of our with still an incomplete detector. Um, we uh, started our physics run on March uh, 2019 with all the detector. And up to last summer, we collected uh, um, almost uh, um, 74 inverse pico barn, but uh, the, there is still a the, the, the full run ongoing. And our goal is to collect uh, up to um, five, uh, 50 inverse atto barn of integrated luminosity. Uh, here you can see an overview of the detector, uh, Bell 2. Mm, it is uh, itself uh, an upgrade uh, with respect to Bell. It is concentrically built around the interaction point. Um, just out the interaction point, we can find the vertex detectors. Uh, we have two layers of pixel detectors uh, that can stand the higher heat rate that we have with respect to Bell. And uh, at, at a safer distance from the interaction point, we have four layer of double-sided silicon strip detectors. The PXD is still incomplete, incomplete and it must be replaced in 2022. Then we have the um, CDC, the central drift chamber, um, which plays a three important role of tracking and measure um, and measure the, the moment of, of the particles, um, but also 
it works uh, uh, as a trigger for signal and also um, it is uh, um, it, it works as a uh, um, particle ident uh, identifier. Um, just at the drift, the drift chamber, we have the particle ident identification devices. Uh, so we have two different, we use two different techniques from barrel region and, and cap region. For the barrel region, we use a time of propagation counter, which uh, um, measures uh, just the time of propagation of the sharing of photon, which reflects inside a quartz bar. And uh, the aerogel ring imaging sharing of counter is instead used for the handcap region. Then we have uh, finally the electromagnetic calorimeter, um, and uh, we, which uh, um, works as uh, mainly as an uh, identifier for neutrals. And the outermost, uh, out, the outermost um, device is the K-Long and Mon detector, which is a uh, different uh, kind of, um, which is different, uh, different uh, detectors from the outer barrel, uh, where it uses uh, resistive plate counters and uh, end caps inner barrel, where there are instead scintillators. So with respect to Bell, we have a better vertex resolution, a larger volume of the silicon strip detector, and a better particle identification. So let me move now to a brief uh, general introduction about dark sector. Uh, so in the last decades, uh, um, we made a very strong experimental effort in searching for dark matter and me mediators to standard model, um, which have uh, which had mass uh, the comparable with the electroweak uh, scale, so the, the so-called WIMP paradigm. In recent years, however, uh, the possibility that both uh, dark matter particles and uh, mediators of dark matter with the standard model have a mass sector below GV scale has gained much attraction. The idea is that um, of this theory is that uh, light dark matter interact uh, uh, weakly to the standard model through a new light mediator. And this mediator um, depends on the portal which can, uh, uh, which can um, uh, mediate between dark sector and standard model. Uh, these models are the, are the vector portal with dark photon or dark Z prime, the epsilon scalar portal, the scalar portal, and the neutrino portal. Um, so, although Bell 2 and Super CACB have been designed mostly as a B factory, uh, this is the perfect uh, place where to search for dark matter and light, um, light dark matter and mediators. Uh, because we have an hermetic detector and we know very well the initial conditions, uh, we have uh, um, collision, a uh, background from collision pile up, which is minimum. And moreover, we have an excellent particle identification and also dedicated triggers uh, for low multiplicity event. The signatures that we can, uh, th that we can see at Bell 2 are, uh, depend mostly on the relationship between the dark matter particle and the mediator mass. Um, so, for example, if we have a uh, dark matter ma mass which is less than half the mediator mass, we will have an invisible, uh, an invisible decay of the mediator. So the, the, the decay of the, the mediator into dark matter will lead to some missing energy into the detector. Uh, otherwise, uh, we uh, will, um, the mediator will will decay into visible uh, final state, uh, which can be a dronic or, or leptonic final state. Alternatively, the mediator can be log long lived, so mm, the length of the mediator can be sizable. Uh, otherwise, it can be off shell. So in this case, uh, in, the mediator is uh, able to produce a pair of dark matter particles. Also. Um, now let's see the, the main searches uh, that are going at Bell 2 and also the, the first results. So the first uh, analysis I will show you is Z prime to invisible. Uh, Z prime um, arises from the L mu L tau model. Uh, the idea is that uh, this Z prime is a new light gauge boson that only interacts with the second and the third generation of left. 
Tons so only with moons and taus. Uh, this model would explain not only uh, dark matter phenomenology, but also some open issue in particle physics, like the um, anomaly of the uh, magnetic moment of the moon, and also some anomalies arising from the decay of the B meson. Um, so we, for the Bell 2, for the first time, uh, looked for, for this uh, topology. So um, electron positron to muon, uh, two oppositely charged muon and a Z prime coming from one of the, of the two muons uh, and with Z prime decaying to invisible final state. So we look for an invisible decaying Z prime coming from, from a muon and uh, um, the analysis also provide the result uh, for uh, um, the, a different scenario. So a scenario in which uh, Z prime can also decay into dark matter or neutrino if, if it is lighter than two muons. Um, the experimental signature um, that have been looked for in, in this analysis is a peak in the distribution of the invariant mass of the system recoiling against the lepton pair and nothing else in the rest of the event. The analysis used the event with exactly two tracks ident identified as a couple of months. So the background are all the ones uh, uh, from the standard model in which uh, electron positron begin to a pair of um, oppositely charged uh, leptons and some missing energy. Uh, the measurement have been performed with uh, data collected during phase two, so the, with the pilot run, and, uh, um, but, but only the 50% of this data were usable due to trigger condition. And this is the... Um, the recoil mass distribution, so the distribution where we should look for an excess, uh, we uh, didn't, um, uh, didn't see any excess, but uh, um, we um, were able to put 90% confidence level upper limits on the coupling cost and G prime. This is the first result ever. And uh, this is also the first Bell 2 physics paper. Um, this is a list of the systematic uncertainties, which is a bit long uh, due to, due to uh, the, the, the few, still a uh, few data we were able to, to use. But this will be much better with the update uh, uh, of, the, of this analysis with also phase 3 data. Um, we also provided a result for a lepton flavor violating Z prime. Uh, the theory is described in this uh, archive I, I put here. Um, also in this case, uh, we see no excess in the recoil mass distribution. Uh, we um, performed an analysis in, uh, the same analysis selection criteria uh, as for the standard Z prime, um, but with an electron replacing a one. The next analysis is always regarding Z prime, but this time too visible. Um, this is also known as monic dark force. Uh, in, this, uh, in this case, the signature is um, uh, always the same up to the, the production of the Z prime, but then the Z prime begin in a pair of muons. So the, we have four muons final state. This analysis has already been performed by Babar with 500 inverse phantom bar. Uh, and uh, mm, this is the, the limit they put uh, on the coupling cost G. The same analysis in progress in Bell. In Bell 2, we want to, uh, we want to reproduce the Babar analysis uh, and obtain, uh, um, obtain possibly better performances with less luminosity. We plan to use uh, about uh, 100 inverse Fentobar no? through an aggressive background suppression. And uh, the study upon background suppression have been done uh, with, the, with the, the dominant background, which is standard model for muons uh, final state, uh, which can be seen in two different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, regime. So we have the 
pi s r 1 and the double photon conversion. Uh, they um, seem the same diagram. In fact, the second is just 90 degree rotated with respect to the ISR, but the double photon conversion is dominant, while ISR is suppressed by uh, CDC acceptance tracks. So Martina, this is, Martina, yes? You're 10 minutes away from the end of your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the double photon conversion is our dominant background. Uh, what can we say about it? Uh, for sure, we have one of the um, muon pair, which has a mass fixed by the, the, the mass of the candidate. The other pair of muons uh, for uh, QED uh, has an emission to the lowest mass possible and has a low PT. So what we expect to see is, uh, so we, we have mostly a demon recalling against a zero mass object. And what we expect to see is a quasi two body process with a peculiar PT. And we also expect uh, the, um, that the um, muon pair momentum to be the best discriminant variables. And in fact, uh, here you can see the um, P mu mu distribution for signal, uh, for simulated signal and background. Um, you can see um, both that for the background, you have a peculiar uh, behavior of um, two body process, and also that is quite discriminant. Um, this variable, together with other discriminant variables, have been used to train. Um, an MPA analysis through an MLP net. And here you can see uh, some performances of this, uh, of this net. So in the left side, you can see the rock curve. Um, and on the right side, you can see um, the let's say the behavior of this figure of merit, which is the ratio between signal efficiency and the square root of background efficiency. And uh, also you can see a line, a line which is, uh, let's say, uh, not by, by result, but uh, this is uh, square root of five. So if, you as, if, if we assume that sensitivity uh, goes uh, as uh, the, the square root of the luminosity and we have, uh, and Babar have uh, five times uh, our luminosity to, to perform this analysis, uh, when we are above this line, we can compensate uh, uh, missing, uh, let's say, um, the lower amount of, of data that we will use for this uh, for this analysis with uh, the, the performance of the net. Um, sensitivity computation is still in progress and also let's say the optimization of this uh, of this net uh, uh, is still uh, ongoing. So uh, let me move to uh, instead action like particles. Um, in, the, in this case, uh, um, we from theory, we know that uh, uh, ALPS are pseudoscalar particles coupling with the, with boson in general. In general, but in this uh, um, analysis, we only uh, consider them coupling with photons. There are two possible scenarios uh, at um, electron-positron collider, which are photon fusion and alpstralung. We will concentrate on this second one, the alpstralung. Uh, the signature for the Alpstralung can be uh, three, mostly depending on the, um, once again, from the, the mass of the, of the particle. Um, you have uh, um, the invisible uh, decay in which uh, the half decays outside the detector or decay into invisible particles. So in this case, you would search for a single photon final state. Uh, a merge uh, case, so two of the photons overlap or merge, and then finally our case, which is three resolved high energetic photons. So we are looking for three photons that uh, sum up to the beam energy and no other particles, uh, no tracks, and we search for a bump into the D-photon and the recoil mass. Uh, these are all the background, uh, even though the, the most dominant is uh, three gamma final state. Uh, here you can see um, the D-photon and recoil um, mass distribution uh, for, um, from 0 to 100 GB square. 
and the different select selection criteria have been uh, used uh, from uh, 0 to 16 and from 16 to 100 GB square uh, for both recoil and uh, um, the photon uh, mass. Um, in this analysis, which is the second Bell 2 physics paper, we, we were able to put uh, a, limited, uh, a limit to the um, cross-section of Alpstralum using, using uh, uh, 445 inverse peak of barn and uh, um, also to the um, constant uh, decoupling constant GA gamma gamma. The measurement have been performed with uh, 445 inverse peak, but uh, these limits are the first obtained with the, for, with the um, fully reconstructed three photon final state. Uh, so these are more extractive than previous limits. Um, now, this is the last, uh, the last uh, analysis I will show you about dark X -trang. No, sorry, this is uh, not the last. <laughs> Um, dark x -tralung. So, uh, according to this theory, the dark photon mass could be generated via spontaneous symmetry breaking mechanism, adding a, a dark X boson H prime to the theory. In a minimal scenario, we search for a single dark photon A prime and a single dark X boson H prime, where the uh, X boson can be produced through an x process, process, which is also sensitive to the dark sector coupling alpha dark. Uh, so A prime, we, we will um, focus on the case um, in which A prime decay into two moons and uh, uh, H prime decays into uh, an invisible final state. So we have different scenario depending on the mass hypothesis, but we, um, the analysis uh, uh, we performed is about uh, this case. So the mass of the X is less than the mass of the dark photon. Um, and this, um, this scenario was uh, up to now investigated by Gloe. What we look for, we are looking for two oppositely charged moons and missing energy and a peak in this distribution. So the uh, two dimensional distribution of the recoiling mass versus the limon mass. Um, these are the background. So the background are all the um, two oppositely um, leptons final state with some missing energy in the detector. But um, over these four background, also additional ones are, uh, are studied. Um, these are the, the plot about expected sensitivity. So um, we uh, are having very promising results, even with only nine inverse phantom bar data set. We are accessing unconstrained regions uh, well beyond cloy coverages, which is uh, this uh, gray triangle here. We are also probing non-trivial epsilon square alpha, alpha dark couplings um, below, uh, let's say, um, 10 to the minus 6. So the really uh, final, uh, the really last analysis I will show you is dark photon into invisible. Um, so this is the uh, um, same dark photon as before. Uh, so a possible standard model extension with a new uh, new massive gauge boson uh, A prime spin one called dark photon. This would couple to would couple to dark matter, and we have also in this case two basic scenarios depending on the, the mass of the particles. Uh, so when the mass of the um, dark matter, the dark particle. You are two minutes away from the very end of your time. Okay, so we will focus on this case. So Abram is invisible again to light dark matter. We look for one photon inside the calorimeter acceptance and nothing else, and a bump hunt in the single photon recall mass versus the theta lab. And we use the single photon trigger, which, which was non, uh, not um, available in the other B factory studies. These are the main background, but the dominant one, the dominant one is the three gamma final state. And uh, these are, are the expected sensitivities. So these dashed lines is our result, very promising also with the 20 inverse phantom bar. We expect basically a better performance than uh, Babar because we have no ACL gaps pointing to the interaction region that they have. And we also have a dedicated trigger for this analysis. And um, so this takes me to conclusion. I, 
so we have uh, already uh, a lot of successfully uh, analysis which are ongoing uh, only with just the pilot run data but uh, a lot of other dark sector searches are in progress also um, some that i didn't uh, even mention and thank you thank you very much martina for the very nice talk so i received a question from mateus but uh, okay we are we have 20 seconds. I will read it very quickly. I think it's very quick to answer. So the question is, in your last analysis of Z prime to mu mu, is there a background from real photo conversion, gamma going to mu mu inside the detector? Uh, okay, in, in the, sorry, which analysis that prime to invisible? Z prime to mu mu. Okay, yeah. Z prime to mu mu. Um, well, we st are still in a very uh, preliminary phase of this analysis. So um, I, I would answer no up to now, but we are still uh, um, still only considering uh, just um, for muons background. Okay. Yeah, the question is more like, um, I know you consider folk virtual photon conversion to, to two muons as a source of backgrounds. But I was just curious, like, because there are so many photons in this e plus, e plus e minus colliders, if you get real photons converting to mu plus or minus inside the detector. But uh, oh, okay. I mean, I have no really uh, intuition to how large that kind of rate would be, but. Uh, Guys, I'm, I'm really, really sorry. To, unfortunately, I have to cut to this interesting discussion. We are running out of time. Really, really sorry, excuse me. No, no, it's fine. Thank you, Martina. So Thank maybe you, you can continue on, on the private chat uh, or uh, in, uh, in one of the rooms, okay? Thank you very much. So thanks a lot, yeah. and Martina. So let me extend the, the thanks to all the speakers of the last session. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting session. So we are uh, almost done for today, but not quite because we still have the poster session. So for the poster session, I think I will, uh, 